So we're going to zoom. We've been focusing largely way in on the molecular level, uh, talking a lot about DNA, and we're going to zoom way out to the macro level and talk about very broad human trends. Um, a very timely to topic, um, provided recent violence here in Boston, um, but we're going to look over historical time periods at human violence. And um, we're very lucky to have Steven Pinker here with us tonight, who is an experimental psychologist and one of the world's most foremost writers on language, mind, and human nature. He is currently Harvard College professor and Johnstone family professor of psychology at Harvard University. And he has, uh, to get a sense of his stature, I think he has seven honorary degrees um, from a variety of universities. Um, and we also have um, a moderator tonight. We're very lucky to have Stephen Heuser, the editor of the idea section from the Boston Globe. Please help me in welcome Stephen and Stephen. Hi, right, thanks. Um, I'm going to kick this off as a journalist with a tougher question, which is, you just wrote an 800-page book, nearly 800-page book, including copious footnotes, um, designed in large part to convince us all that there's good news, which is that human violence is, has decreased. We're living in a less violent world than we used to. We're sitting in this room right now. We're just a block, a few blocks away from a catastrophic recent bombing. Three people were killed. The city was brought to a halt. There were firefights across towns, and violence is uppermost in our minds right now. Um, if I were your lawyer, the question I would ask right now is, do you wish to change your statement? <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely not. And there's a, uh, there's a sense in which the news is my enemy in that uh, I'm talking about rates of violence, and um, that uh, a rate has a numerator and a denominator, and the numerator is how, much, how many violent acts there are, and the denominator is how many opportunities for violent acts there are, and that includes things like what's the size of the population. And um, I tell my story in the book in a lot of graphs that plot rates of violence, and, and a lot of the, the, the graphs kind of go like this, but they don't go to zero. So there are still uh, incidents of violence. There are wars, there are homicides, there are terrorist bombings, and so on. The thing is that they all get into the news. News is about stuff that happens, not about stuff that doesn't happen. And so all of the cities and countries and days that don't have bombs going off, we don't read about. Uh, those go into the denominator. And so as long as rates of violence haven't gone down to zero, there are always enough events to fill the news. And so, and especially given that the human mind estimates risk by availability of examples, that's uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky's availability heuristic, our sense of danger can be uh, distorted by the way they're, they're reported in the, uh, in the media. Uh, and um, also, uh, another thing that, that, um, uh, that I think makes the message of better angels more counterintuitive than it should be is that we care a lot more about violence than we used to. Uh, and so when violence does occur, as you noted, it does paralyze the city. You have, even though in the 1970s there were far more terrorist bombings and they did a lot more damage than what we saw last week, not to minimize the, the uh, tragedy and the crime, but um, you just didn't have uh, vigils and round-the-clock coverage and massive memorial services for all of the bombs being set off by the Weathermen and the Badr Meinhof Gang and the Red Brigades and the IRA and the Popular Front for the Liberation of this, that, and the other thing. But now every, it's as if every life really does mean more to us. It's one of the reasons that violence has gone down, but it also means that our impression is that violence goes up because we care more about the violence that does take place. So you're saying, one, that I'm part of the problem. And part as, of the solution. As a member of the media. Yeah, and part of the solution. And absolutely. two, that our concern about it basically reflects a changing view of the importance of, of each human life. Yeah. Um, I want to roll the clock back all the way now. The book you wrote is an absolutely sweeping history. I mean, the 800 pages are needed in part just because it's so flush with examples and sort of goes so deep, starts so early, and sort of works so painstakingly through, uh, you know, this phenomenon and that percolates through all of society. If we go all the way back, you talk about prehistoric man, 
And it sounds like there's some evidence to suggest that if you're a prehistoric person, you stood maybe a 15% chance of, your, of ending your life by being killed by another person. Yeah, uh, that the, uh, when it comes to uh, what used to be called life in a state of nature, mm -hmm. but which more technically could be called, uh, I think, life outside the control of states. So that's both um, archaeological evidence from prehistoric societies before the rise of the state and those pockets of the world that still have a tribal life beyond the reach of the law. Yeah, the, the chance of being killed in violence are far higher than those of modern societies. You have an incredible litany of things that happen to the, the prehistoric bodies that we do have, the litany of things that appear to have happened to them. Yes, if the, uh, oh, like you know, mummies found with ropes around their necks and arrowheads embedded in bones yeah. and decapitations and bashed in skulls and uh, parry fractures. This is kind of forensic archaeology, uh, CSI Paleolithic. Uh, how do you, uh, with prehistoric remains, how do you determine cause of death? And one of them is you, you tend not to get ulnar bone fractures for anything other than parrying a blow from oh. someone else. And so that's one of the techniques that they use. But just to make, just an, I, although I don't like to make a case with anecdotes, one thing that struck me is you know, the world's attention was riveted when that um, mummified corpse was discovered in the Tyrolean Alps, Itzy. The uh, hikers, to their astonishment, came across this. Uh, uh, I think it was 5,000-year-old frozen mummy uh, in, uh, that was kind of being exposed as the glacier mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in the uh, Alps started to melt. And uh, he's a subject of great fascination. And as they studied him more and more, they discovered that he had an arrowhead in, <laughs> embedded in his shoulder blade. So he was a victim of foul play. And he was holding a knife that had the uh, blood, as determined by DNA, of three individuals on it. <laughs> <laughs> this is just one guy. You know, I mean, it's a sample of one. But the one guy who just, uh, you know, our dumb luck, his body happened to be in the deep freeze and just a sample of one guy who happened to get frozen, and sure enough, he was involved with four homicides, including himself. Just another day in the mountain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess we don't expect that in New Hampshire these days. <laughs> Very different. Um, I want to pause for just a sec. We're gonna, the conversation is allotted for an hour here. Um, this is an interesting topic that people, I assume, will have quite a bit to ask, and so um, I'll plan to, we'll plan to allow some questions at the end, um, and I'll just, I'll just give everybody a heads up before that happens. So if you have questions, you can stand up at the microphones. Um, OK, so sweeping. You have a sweeping view of human history you take in this book. This is, uh, you're a scientist, and science starts with data, um, not with rough observations, and this is a whole conference dedicated to data. Um, talk a little bit about the data set, this, this data sets that you work with, and the way you can build this argument on, with anything approaching the rigor that you need to actually publish it under your name as a scientist. <laughs> well, for, for different kinds of violence and for different historical um, time spans, the data sets are different. So for um, comparisons of life before or outside of states versus uh, in state civilizations, the two sources are forensic archaeology, that is the guys who uh, look for signs of foul play in the skeletons, and uh, ethnographic vital statistics. The anthropologists who live with a society for a long enough period of time that they uh, count all the births and deaths and the causes of death, and uh, from that you get a reasonably good estimates of uh, rate of death in warfare. But then I also look at um, over centuries, mm -hmm. where at uh, rates of homicide, which the, the data are surprisingly rich because in the um, <clears throat> starting around the 13th century, a lot of European uh, countries started to keep lo at least local homicide data. Uh, Homicides are uh, discrete events. They're, there's a less kind of he said, she said, you know, a corpse is a corpse. And um, so there's much more agreement as to what a, uh, a, hom what a homicide consists of. And uh, the, one of the reasons they kept these data is that the uh, king had the bright idea that instead of there being blood money, where the uh, family of the perpetrator pays the family of the victim, uh, if the family of the perpetrator has to pay the king, that's a great source of revenue. And so the king would send out a uh, representative who once a year would go from town to town and tally up all of the homicides that had taken place in the past year so that he could confiscate the assets of the families of the perpetrator. And that 
that man had a name. He was called the coroner. That is the representative of the crown. That's why he's called a coroner. And that's how we inherited that word for uh, the, the investigator of, of uh, homicides. But as a result, the data in a lot of dusty old town hall uh, archives go back to, uh, 800 years. And historical criminologists have plotted them. And they, there's, they're, they're noisy, but they show an unmistakable trend. I mean, so big that any artifact you can think of could not uh, explain it. And the, the trend kind of goes down so that uh, in contemporary European countries, the homicide rate is about 1 50th of what it was in the Middle Ages. So it's a big, that's a, a, a big effect. For wars, um, the f closer you get to the present, the better our data are. And so they're much more conjectural in earlier eras. Since 1946, we have a data set from uh, the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, where they have done their best to count wars and count deaths in war. And, and the, the news media have, have uh, been um, assiduous enough since then, so the, the counts, I think, are pretty trustworthy. Earlier, there are only four bigger war. The bigger the war, the better the data. And for the biggest wars, the ones involving the, the five or six great powers of the era where no, no one could have missed when they got into a war, plenty of historians writing that down, that goes back about 500 years. Then there's an entire other category of, of uh, institutionalized violence where we can just look at the history of the legal system. So for example, when a country gets around to abolishing slavery, that's a discrete act that's in the historical record. And so I have timelines of abolition of practices like, like slavery. Um, and then for other uh, non-lethal crimes, it gets a little trickier. So rape, for example, is notoriously subject to both uh, the willingness of the victim to go to the police and, of course, the definition of what really counts as a, as a, uh, as a rape. Um, but the... Uh, the um, FBI does victimization surveys every year, which are at least um, surmount the problems of going to the police. These are anonymous surveys in which they ask, have you been the victim of any of the following crimes? Those go back several decades. They try to correct for various sources of bias, and so that's yet another data set. So you're sort of moving in a number of time cycles. Yes, it's a kind of a, a number of different orders of magnitude. And, and the, the interesting thing is that the, the historical decline of violence does have this fractal category, char, character where uh, you can observe it over the millennia, over the centuries, and over the decades, over the years. Um, can you just kind of characterize when you roll the data up into a ball and you take a look at the fractal, the shape of it, what, uh, what do you see? What, what's the, numerically speaking, or uh, proportionally speaking, what, is the, the, what are the broad trends? So there's, um, I think there's a big difference between living in um, tribal anarchy and living in a state. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, states tend to re try to reduce violence within their borders, not because they're, they've, especially the first states were particularly uh, benevolent, mm -hmm. but their motive was kind of like a farmer that tries to prevent his livestock from killing each other. Namely, he doesn't care what the grievance of one cow against another cow. It's just a dead loss for him. But he wants to just stamp out all of the skirmishes because he'd rather, in the case of the kings, he'd rather keep them alive to supply them with taxes and, and slaves. But the result is that rates of death are lower in state societies than in tribal ones. So that's one big factor. You had, the, you had one interesting observation, sorry to interrupt, yeah. that, that like even the most peaceful tribal societies have a murder rate about that of Detroit. Yes, that's right. These are the, the various tribes that have been touted by anthropologists as peaceful people, gentle people, and so on. You know, and they are if you count absolute number of deaths, but uh, when you have a uh, village of 50 people, even one murder gives you a pretty high murder rate. Uh, so then there's the, the decline in homicide since the Middle Ages is a, another trend, and that reduced, that was about a factor of about 30 to 50. Uh, there is a number of, this is more of a qualitative uh, development, but since the Enlightenment in the 18th century, there was a, um, a cascade of humanitarian reforms, the abolition of slavery, uh, abolition of gruesome torture as a form of criminal punishment, you know, disemboweling, breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, uh, pulling, being pulled apart by horses, all of that kind of gruesome stuff. Uh, since then you have to fast forward to the end of World War II when uh, for the first time you had a real uh, reduction in, in war. Uh, prior to that time, there were two crisscrossing trends. Uh, 
the number of wars went down, but the destructiveness of war went up. So there were fewer wars, but when they happened, they were doozies. And there's just an extraordinary spike in the first half of the 20th century. Yeah, there are two, two spikes for the two world wars. But then after World War II, uh, an interesting thing happened. The number of wars kept going down, but the destructiveness of wars went down too. And so the overall rate of death in war has kind of zigzagged down since 1945. Then there's, there's violence on smaller scales that has come down in the, uh, pretty much since the 50s. And these include things like um, uh, hate crimes against uh, gay people and uh, racial minorities, lynching, uh, which used to take place at a rate of about three a week in this, in this country and was stamped out by the 1950s. Um, child abuse is down, spanking, corporal punishment in schools like uh, strapping and paddling. Bullying is down. Uh, I mentioned rape is down. Domestic violence, like uh, 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 husbands beating wives, is down. And then uh, probably the last of these trends is uh, violence against animals, where vegetarianism is up, hunting is down, uh, number of motion pictures in which animals were harmed is down. Uh, so people care about a lot more categories of violence than they used to. You had said in one story, I think, that you had tortured a rat to death as a graduate student and sort of are horrified by that in retrospect, and it was considered a normal practice at the time. Yeah, the, uh, a very dramatic, anyone who's worked in, in uh, biological research knows that uh, the, the um, regime for the protection of animals in research uh, has just uh, uh, exploded. And so uh, in the 70s when I was an undergraduate and I was working in a lab, and you could kind of do whatever you wanted, and you know, they were just animals. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is very far from the situation now. So the numbers you're talking about, I mean, 50-fold reductions, I mean, these are immense, immense changes in the scale of violence. And so faced with that, and what seems like a piece of good news that we have trouble digesting, but seems, seems you, you, know, you seem to succeed in proving, the thing you set out to do in the book about violence is to use your set of skills and knowledge to explain, to sort of try to get inside the human mind and the sort of human nature, and to explain what is it, what might be, what might be we looking at, uh, it's not just improved laws and so forth, although there's like certainly a component of that. But what might have happened to human society over time and human beings over time? So I know the answer to that is hundreds of pages long. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I would like to talk a little bit about the, like a couple of the sort of the important institutions and shifts and sort of how yeah. we live together uh, that you detected as being hugely influential in this. Yeah. Well, I mean, since we're at the conference on genomes, uh, environments, and traits, I'll, I'll start with genomes, and, because since it is a frequently asked question, uh, have we literally evolved mm -hmm. to be less violent? Has, has our, have our instincts for violence been bred out of us? I mean, that would be a uh, uh, first question one might ask. And I, I, the position I take in the book is uh, probably not. Uh, that's probably not the answer. For one thing, some of these declines are far too recent to have been the results of evolution in the Darwinian sense of a change in gene frequencies over time due to differential fecundity and, and survival, survivorship. Uh, if you look at, say, the halving of the American uh, crime rate since 1992, uh, or even the decline of war since 1945, there just haven't been enough generations for that to have been a factor. Now, what about over some of the longer trends, like from the Middle Ages to the present, or even from prehistoric times to modern times? It is theoretically possible that, uh, that the more warlike people uh, died at each other's hands and that the meek inherited the earth. Uh, that is, the numbers are uh, big enough there that it could have happened. And we also know from the biological basis of violence that there are um, targets. I mean, it's a target-rich area for genetic modification. We know that the uh, um, development of the frontal lobe for example, uh, is one thing that can inhibit violent impulses, and that's probably under genetic control. Amount and sense of uh, testosterone and uh, density and location of testosterone receptors could be another. Uh, working in the other direction, prevalence of oxytocin and receptors for oxytocin can ramp down violence. Um, so there's no shortage of ways in which the genes could have made us less violent. Uh, the attitude that I take is since we know that that um, there are uh, some declines that could not have been genetic since they're so recent. Uh, and since there's no evidence that we have become less violent genetically, 
I just went with the parsimonious assumption that all of the changes have been environmental. Mm -hmm. Together with the fact that we do see, even in uh, more or less peaceful uh, modern uh, individuals, you certainly see lots of signs of, uh, of capacity for violence, such as the fact that um, uh, about half of our two-year-olds kick, bite, and hit. Uh, we don't have to teach kids to be violent. We have to teach them not to be violent. Uh, play fighting among boys is one of the most robust human universals. We have huge industries that feed people with simulated violence, uh, video games, uh, Shakespearean tragedies, you know, movies starring a certain ex-governor of California, ice hockey. Uh, so we, we, we crave it, even if we don't uh, engage in it. And um, if you don't look at behavior, but you look at fantasy life, which as a psychologist I consider to be uh, more informative about human nature, and I suspect closer to the genes, uh, you find that a majority of people will confess to at least occasionally fantasizing about killing someone they don't like. So my assumption, uh, also reinforced by the fact that uh, if there were changes in genetic basis for violence, it would lead to the politically uncomfortable possibility that people, one race or ethnic group that's been in a situation in which violence has been, con been controlled for a longer period of time might be genetically less prone to violence than some other one, a hypothesis that simply can't be investigated in this political climate, and so we don't have the data that we would need in any case. So parsimony would say that it's not a genetic change. What are some of the, well, the E stands for environments. So what are some of the environmental changes? Uh, there's government. If you uh, outsource your revenge and uh, protection to a disinterested third party, instead of having to do it you know, kind of Corleone style, namely no one wants to mess with you because they know that you will seek revenge, uh, the body count tends to go down because uh, in any dispute, both sides uh, always think that uh, their violence is justified revenge after the fact, and the other guy's violence is naked aggression out of the blue. So, you know, the Corleones and the Tatalias, uh, each one of them thinks that the other side is treacherous, and so you can get blood feuds and, and uh, endless vendettas. If you uh, kind of outsource it to the, the, the police and the court system, you may not like their verdict, but uh, you're more likely to accept it, and the overall body count is likely to, likely to be lower. I think a second uh, environmental change is um, a commerce and exchange. When you have a commercial economy, especially one that's not based on stuff like land and uh, gold, uh, but on uh, ideas, uh, but even if it is stuff, if you can easily move it around on roads and, and, and oceans and in the, in the air, it kind of becomes cheaper to buy stuff than to steal it. Uh, and uh, other people become more valuable to you alive than dead. Uh, and so uh, there's less of an incentive to try to get rich via conquest. Uh, you know, one person quipped that you know, it, really, it really would not make sense if some country wanted to uh, achieve the wealth of the United States to invade Silicon Valley. I mean, they just, the idea just does, is, is kind of silly on the face of it. Uh, whereas in the past, you might have invaded land because more farmland, more minerals, and so on, but diamonds. no longer true. Oil diamonds. Oil and, oh, well, exactly, oil and diamonds. A third change is, um, I think, a rise in, in um, cosmopolitanism, that is how much people interact with people unlike them, either directly but via travel and study or indirectly via media, news, fiction, film, and so on. So you, we feel more and more uh, that the world is our community. We feel less tribal, and it, that makes it a little harder to demonize um, uh, or, or dehumanize um, other people. And finally, I think we're just, as a species, getting smarter in the sense of, not again, not in the genetic sense, but um, just as any, almost any aspect of human life, if you quantify it, it's gotten incrementally better. We live longer, we're less likely to starve to death, uh, we're less, less likely to be felled by infectious diseases, uh, our, uh, we, you know, we have better, our iPods get better, our computers get better, and you know, violence is another um, challenge to living a comfortable life. Uh, it's a nuisance, and I think we get smarter and smarter at dealing with violence as a problem to be solved. So you talk about, there's a thing called the Flynn effect, right, which is the sort of puzzling the puzzling habit of humans to appear to get smarter over the decades and over the last century, you keep having to average the like a hundred IQ level upward and upward because 
an average kid today would have, what, scored 130 on an IQ test in 1910 or something yes, like that? Yes, right. So you described something you call the moral Flynn effect. And I think that's what you're talking about right now. Yeah. But a sense in which, in some way, we're actually, without necessarily changing who we are, because you seem possibly frustrated at human nature's persistent, unchanging qualities in some way, but uh, without actually changing who we are, something changes about like, how we treat each other or what our sort of moral sensibility is. Um, and you detect a lot of that, in the, especially in the recent past. So he talked a little bit about how a, st a fixed, a more or less fixed human nature, let's say it's fairly fixed over the time period we're talking about, uh, might undergo that kind of development or that kind of change, um, because it seems almost very internal. Um, but the things you're describing are very external, like very circumstantial and very external. Yeah. Well, one of the features of human nature is uh, a combinatorial system that can spin out ideas and share them. So human cognition, we combine uh, simple ideas to form more complicated ideas. Each one of them becomes a unit which can then be recombined with other complex ideas. And thanks to language, we can share them, pool them, accumulate them. Uh, you know, that's, how, that's how we uh, develop technology and science. But it's also how we develop political and moral systems. And even though there's, a, there's some you know, zigging and zagging, but I think there's also some uh, progress in the sense that certain ideas just lose. They are um, not viable when they have to confront other ideas. And if you have enough literate people exchanging ideas, if you have a freedom of speech so you don't suppress ideas that are embarrassing to people in power, then I think the conversation moves in a certain direction. And you can see that, I think, accelerating. So if just an example, you know, slavery, uh, people used to debate it. There were two sides to the debate. Uh, you know, pro-slavery, anti-slavery. That just seems right. inconceivable to us today. Like, you know, one side was right, one side is wrong, and history uh, uh, rendered its verdict. Uh, but we've seen that happening more and more, and I think faster and faster. Uh, racial segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I lived through that debate. I was a child. But you had in the late 50s and early 60s two sides to the debate as to whether black and white kids should go to separate schools. The segregationists lost, and that's probably not coming back. More recent uh, women's rights in the 70s, uh, gay rights in the, um, starting in the 70s, accelerating in the 90s. The debate has changed so much that, uh, in that regard that there used to be a debate as to whether homosexual behavior could be criminalized. Supreme Court decided in 2004, no, that's unconstitutional. Then the debate shifted to, should gay people uh, be allowed to marry in a form recognized by the state? That seemed uh, for a while to be just you know, a, a utopian dream. Very quickly, it's just going to, it's clearly it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so the, and, and it, the reason that all of these uh, ideas uh, develop, I think, is because there really are cases where if you believe that it's good for people to be happy and fulfilled and bad for them to be you know, unhappy and frustrated, uh, certain things follow, certain ways of living your life. Just uh, if you explore the, the consequences, that's the way the, the debate's going to go. And I think that's been the source of a lot of moral progress and political progress. Uh, and that's what you get when you have a species that it can exchange and accumulate ideas. So it sounds uncomfortably to me like if you took me and you, I were born in 200 years ago, I would hold a different set of beliefs, probably behave pretty differently to a lot of people around me. I have beliefs that I might find completely repugnant now, but I might have held them at the time. And if you took me and you know, scrolled back 15,000 years ago, I probably would currently be clubbing you. We would have <laughs> probably finished this conversation long ago, and it would have been very ugly. Um, uh, that sounds a lot to me like uh, you know the the powerful influence of the society around me, the culture around me, is something that completely shapes like my propensity to violence, my inclination to settle things by my fists. That also sounds to me a lot like a, like I'm a blank slate, like I'm a culturally like I am a vessel waiting for the culture to pour its values into me, which I then express, which is a specific idea that you've argued against. Yeah. Well, if culture was given to us by Martians, then maybe that would be a. Uh you know, a viable way of interpreting that. But the thing is that we're the ones who are creating the culture in the first place, that uh, when you talk about effects of culture, it's not that it um, shows the effect of a blank slate, because you know, who is it that came up with the culture? Who is it that formulated these ideas? Who is it that uh, could recognize that some ideas make more sense than others? Who is it that could even understand ideas like uh, human rights, which is a very abstract, airy, fairy concept? Um, and the answer is only creatures with brains with a certain structure. Mm -hmm. That is, with the ability to 
uh, conceive and combine abstract ideas and to share them in such precise forms via language. Uh, so I've never thought that um, culture uh, could ever be minimized as a critical factor in human affairs, but rather I've been curious as to what is it about us that allows us to develop and share culture. It's just not a surrounding force like a kind of miasma or a gas that we inhale. It's something that we ourselves have to be smart enough to create. So it seems like a long feedback loop between something kind of irreducible about what a person is and something that consistently changes. Yes, it shifts about what's outside the person and how those two things interact. Exactly. We're, we're great consumers of uh, ideas and norms and values, but we also make our contribution to shaping that pool and, and language being one of the main media through which we do it. So your book is kind of a rousing defense of optimism about sort of where we are right now. It's a sort of three cheers for humanism, uh, sort of the rights revolution, a lot of contemporary values. Uh, and has this overall very encouraging message, and it's a message that at times like this, it's kind of exciting to hear because you sort of realize when you pull back and look at the data in aggregate, you know, the daily stories and the sort of tragic sense that we have of what life is like right now and how bad things are is, is, is wrong. And in fact, we can live our lives in this productive way because when we walk out of our houses, we're not being clubbed. Um, so that's, I mean, it's, a, it's an optimistic message overall. Um, and one thing I wonder is, having thought about this, and these trends, what do you worry about? Because you also say in your book, like these, there's no guarantee these trends will continue. Yeah. So what, what would concern you, or what, what, what warning signs when, you, when we look for, what would you worry about that you either see happening now or that could happen, like a scale that could kind of tip and mm -hmm. sort of reverse these encouraging trends? Well, among the, the um, kind of diseases that are always present at a low level are um, uh, toxic political ideologies that could be uh, uh, wielded by powerful men, uh, ideologies like nationalism, like um, uh, religious fundamentalism. Uh, so those would have the capacity to shape human nature, to interact with them in a, also extremely effectively. Well, they can, especially... But push them in a different direction. And it may not even have to interact with human nature. It could just be one guy who seizes control of a country yeah. who's in, in the... And so, nationalistic strains in uh, China, uh, Putinism, Chavismo, um, cases where you know, the ultimate weapon of mass destruction is a government. And even though governments can uh, pacify people within them, they can also do a lot of damage, both to their own people and others. And so if you have a retreat from um, liberal democracy to uh, virulent nationalism or religious fundamentalism, that could be uh, uh, dangerous. You know, it's kind of a Kim Jong-un with a combination of the Marxist ideology with the uh, kind of narcissistic despot syndrome uh, and with nuclear weapons. Yep. It's very hard to say that nothing bad will happen. I mean, I, don't, I think chances are nothing bad will happen, but the chances are, you know, zero. Uh, if there's mammoth uh, environmental disruption through climate change. That's something to worry about. If there were uh, weapons of mass destruction that got into the hands of a small number of malevolent people, there, even though I think the probability is low, the damage could be high. Uh, so those are, those, are, those are three things. Yeah, we think about exogenous factors, I guess, in human culture. That it's, I've read some fairly dark findings about the ability of climate to affect sort of the levels of hostility in a region? Well, that is, isn't to be taken for granted. That is, you know, I, think that, I think we should be quite concerned with climate change, although climate change could cause a lot of misery and waste uh, without necessarily causing armed conflict. They don't follow uh, as day follows night. That, that um, a number of studies that have tried to correlate climate stress, drought, water shortages at time one with armed conflict at time two find little to no correlation. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you think about, you know, our, there can be some pretty severe disruptions like the Great American Dust Bowl that did not lead to a civil war. And when we did have a civil war, it had nothing to do with uh, you know, climate or, or water. Uh, and, and indeed, it's not easy to think of a lot of wars that had anything to do with fighting over limited resources. It's almost always revenge, glory, uh, ideology, um, uh, power, taking over territory, uh, 
nationalism, all these cockamamie things that really don't buy you anything mm -hmm. useful, but they're ideas, bad, you know, toxic ideas. UNESCO's motto is wars begin in the minds of men, and there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, this is, which is not to say that we should minimize the, um, the, the possible harm of climate change, such as you know, droughts, displacement, starvation, um, uh, poverty, and so on, but that those don't automatically lead to two organized armies shooting at each other. Um, we're at a uh, conference about the genome, so I thought I would sort of bring it back a couple of years to your pioneering involvement in the personal genome project. You did a whole first-person article in the New York Times Magazine about getting the results of your genome, and you were one of the first 10 people to have it publicized. Um, a few years have passed since you've reflected on it in public, at least, and I wonder, as, the, as it's evolved, and also kind of being out in front publicly like that as sort of a face of it, um, uh, how has it affected you? Yeah. Um, you know, not, not much. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I have my, my genomes on the internet. Uh, I have it on my webpage. I have my uh, sh short bio, my long bio, my curriculum vita, photographs of me for you know, posters yeah. and stuff, a uh, scan of my brain and my genome. So I'm, I'm kind of out there. But I did it not because I'm an exhibitionist, but just because I know there's just nothing interesting in there. It really is. It's a bunch of A's and T's and C's and G's, and we don't know how to read it. And uh, the Around the time that, that uh, George Church and, and uh, his collaborators set up the Personal Genome Project, the first 10 of us had discussions of, you know, what were the risks, what are we afraid of? Someone said, well, gee, what happens if, uh, you know, I have the, the dishonesty gene and, you know, my daughter's boyfriends, you know, look it up and they find that her father has is dishonest. And the thing is that uh, in just about anything of any human interest, you get much more information from direct uh, indicators of the phenotype than you do from the genotype. Uh, at, not only because the, uh, we don't know how to read the, the, uh, the, the genomic data yet, uh, just the causal chain is so uh, intricately complex that it's very hard to work backwards. Uh, but also, we even know, uh, you know, I'm a great believer in, in the old-fashioned study of behavioral genetics, the study of twins and adoptees as a source of information about uh, effects of genes. We know that genes matter a lot in aggregate. There's a, if you had an identical twin who was separated from you at birth, you'd be much more similar to him than to anyone in this room. On the other hand, the two of you would not be indistinguishable. There is, uh, you know, he might be gay while you were straight or vice versa. Uh, you, your intelligence would be correlated, but not perfectly. That sets an upper bound as to how much we'll ever be able to read from the genes. Even if we could decode it them entirely, we'd have a lot of statistical information, but not a whole lot of individual personal information. And that's why I felt completely comfortable going public. So even, like, if, even if terrorists got hold of it, what could they possibly what could do? They, yeah, what, what could they do? Or what could they do that they wouldn't? If, if someone wanted to snoop around and embarrass me, uh, they would get a lot more by hacking into my email than they could by hacking into my genome. You had an example in your article that I personally found particularly galling, which is that your <laughs> genome tells you that you are more likely than average to be bald. Yes, I have the baldness gene. <laughs> then I realized what it means to have the baldness gene, uh, you know, the baldness gene. It means that someone published a study somewhere in the literature, and, and Snipedia found it, uh, and they got a sample of guys and uh, looked at the ones who had this allele versus that allele, correlated it with, you know, a bunch of traits, and they found that the, among the people who had the allele that I had, 80% of them were bald and 20% of them weren't bald. So what does that say about me? What it says about me is, if I was in that study, I would have been in the 20%. <laughs> yep. In other words, it says you know, virtually nothing. Yep. Uh, and that's the thing about the diagnosticity of genetic information for, person, for most personal traits. Mm -hmm. Now, the exception is, that is, they're so probabilistic and statistical that you're always better looking at the phenotype. Mm -hmm. uh, and because the phenotype reflects not only the influence of you know, the so-called baldness gene, but it represents the influence of the other uh, 19,999 genes and their interactions and all of the things, the, the information that's not carried in sequence, sequences, but in confirmation of the chromatin or whatever else might carry information, uh, and the 
uh, information from the idiosyncratic environment of your brain as it was kind of gelling in the womb and everything that, that's happened to you. Uh, the contribution of any handful of genes is, you know, even though it's, it's real, it's not zero, but it is such a small part of the overall pie that it's, it's close to useless. Now, the exception is genes that, you know, in the classical sense, you know, genes code for a protein. And um, if there is something that can go wrong because of one malformed protein, having that gene says that you'll have that protein. Now, most traits depend on a lot more than just one protein. But I did find a couple of interesting things about myself. One of them, and again, these much more likely when there are genes for things that can go wrong than for complex traits. So I have a gene for, um, a recessive gene for familial dysautonomia, uh, which is a uh, Mendelian recessive disease that leads to a, uh, a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, of sweating, digestion, heart rate, breathing, and so on. And it leads to a rather unpleasant life and early death. It's a recessive gene, which means that it wouldn't, would only be a um, factor if uh, my wife also had a copy. And it turns out my wife does have a copy. Uh, so both of us are, uh, have a copy of that gene. If we had met earlier in life and had children, before this test was developed, we would have had a one in four chance uh, that each one of uh, our children could have had this rather uh, unpleasant disease. Uh, we, it's not a massive coincidence that we both have it. Uh, we're both Ashkenazi Jewish, which meant that we, our ancestors were a kind of a closed breeding pool in Eastern Europe several hundred years ago. It means we had uh, almost certainly one individual in our ancestry who had that mutation, whose many descendants included each of us on different branches. Uh, but that kind of information uh, it could lead to the aversion of uh, many tragedies, as we sure. saw a primitive version with, with uh, say, the um, Tay-Sachs screen several decades ago. And I think that is going to be an enormously positive uh, development. Now, you've said um, personal genomics at this point is more recreational than yeah. diagnostic. Um, why'd you do it? Oh. Um, well, I've written about effects of genes on uh, personality, and so I just wanted to have a, a firsthand um, uh, experience with it. Uh, it did give me an appreciation for what the gene for X means. It just means someone did a study, and they got a statistically significant result. Uh, and um, yeah, so it made it that, that much more real. And there are other things that have nothing to do with uh, traits that, um, that are still of interest, such as ancestry. Uh, the fact that I have a Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA that are concentrated in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, is of interest because it reminds, kind of reminds me that if you're, if you're Jewish, you're kind of a mongrel of kind of basically Palestinian and Polish is the way I think of it, and, uh, or Italian. I mean, sort of all Eastern and Southern Mediterranean. So the fact that I actually have genes that go back to the Eastern Mediterranean, even though I haven't had ancestors there for more than a thousand years is kind of interesting and just sort of tracing you know, where my ancestry came from. Yeah, and this is, I mean, leads into the next question I was going to ask, I guess, which is that if you, you're a researcher um, who thinks in very broad terms about the sweep of human history, the sort of long evolution of human nature, the broad statistics of, about human violence, and you're confronted with this, through this very modern way, you're confronted with the list of information about yourself that ties you really directly. Um, like how does it how does it feel like how do you how do you see yourself you know with regard to the sort of the, these bigger questions that you ask in your research? Well, it, it is it, it is thrilling to see myself as part of this big tree of humanity, but and one where you can get uh, you can get tribal and you can look at like one branch, but then it's very easy with these browsers to zoom out and get global and see that you're just one branch of a tree that incorporates all of humanity. Uh, so parochially, it's kind of fun to see your tribal sub-sub-sub-branch, but globally and humanistically, it's even more thrilling to see yourself as part of a, of a huge species. We tend to think about uh, genes as uh, like almost like a fingerprint. We talk about it in terms of individuality, and it's much, much more than that. It's like an expression of an aggregate kind of self. It is. And, uh, and one thing that also you have to keep in mind when looking at the ancestry trees, which you tend to get from these recreational genetics companies only for 
mitochondrial DNA, uh, your mom's 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 mom, and Y chromosome, your dad's 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 dad. Uh, but of course, you're a mixture of lots of other genes. And you also realize when you think it through um, that you, know, you had two parents, four grandparents, eight uh, uh, great-grandparents, uh, 16 great-great-grandparents. And the whole concept of ancestry pretty much breaks down after you go back a few generations. Everyone's related to everyone else. Uh, and the whole concept of what is my bloodline uh, becomes meaningless once you do the math. Right, like sharing two great, 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 great grandfathers with an American president. Yes. Your which, belt is related to that person as your dog. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's, it's not too different from that, right? That's right. I mean, there are only so many ancestors to go around. Yeah. You know, they increase exponentially in, yeah. in theory, but of course can't increase exponentially in reality. There has to be the phenomenon the genealogists call pedigree collapse. Namely, your pedigree goes like that and then has to converge because there are only so many people around and you're related to more and more of them the farther back you go. And there's also that sort of curious human habit of embracing the distinction of your great your greatest ancestor and somehow like conveniently ignoring the yes the various like the lunatic thugs, in the attic the thugs yes, the right the, the ne'er do wells yeah and so that that's a way in which the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome are misleading it's just one little strand of this very bushy branch that's sort of your story but it's also kind of everybody's story yeah. at the same time that's right um, the uh, the idea of taking your own genome and putting it out uh, just putting it in front of the public and kind of risk be damned. I mean, early on when you did this, it was unclear what the risks would be, and now it sounds like they're not grave, at least as far as you've been able to tell. But this idea of putting it out there for everyone to see in the interest of science, in the interest of whatever progress we might get out of it, um, Jason pointed out that that's an excellent example of prosociality, yes. um, which you know is presumably one of the traits in your book. Yes, and, the, and there is there was also, um, in, in being one of the first contributors to the Personal Genome Project, it started with 10, but I think its target now is, what, 100,000 genomes? Uh, but I, yeah, I do think that it's, um, um, I hope it, it'll be a, a kind of encouragement of other people to contribute to science. And I'll mention one other thing that I, of, of temporary interest that I learned from my genome. Uh, the um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, George uh, Thakuria, who's the uh, medical geneticist associated with the project, called me one time with kind of a very grave tone in his voice. Uh, and he said that one of the genes that I have has been associated in the medical literature with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That is a thickening of the muscle of the heart tissue whose uh, first symptom I learned when I looked it up is death. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, and a number of the uh, athletes who get cut down in the prime of life, uh, Reggie Lewis is the one that I think of as a, as a Celtics fan, uh, had a condition like this. And uh, I had a gene that had been associated in the literature. And so first I went to the literature, and I was a little bit reassured that like a lot of gene trait associations, you know, you could kind of see it if you squint, but it was also a bit sketchy. There were some counterexamples. So I made a beeline to a... Uh, uh, to get an echocardiogram because this condition is very easily diagnosable from uh, an echocardiogram, and I was fine. I mean, it took exactly five seconds for uh, the cardiologist to look at it and say, no, you don't have it. Uh, so, but you know, it's a little, little bit of a scare. Anyway, I entered the scientific literature for the first time not as an author, but as a, a case study. Uh, so I contributed to the weakening of this gene trait association. That is, I was a you know kind of a false positive. Yeah, you were the twenty percent. I was the the, uh, the twenty percent. Uh, yes, but and but in this case, for a an association that was far far smaller. So me, uh, I changed the literature as a uh, research subject, and and as more and more people do that, uh, we'll have a better idea of which of these associations are spurious, just the result of overfitting or or bad luck of a particular sample in which ones are genuine. So do you, is it reasonable to say, like in the impulse to take your own information and to donate it to the world, you do, we do see the thread, this is an expression of an, uh, this is an expression of a human trait that's been, you know, cultivated, enabled in more modern societies? Uh, I, I, would, I would like to think so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, the, the idea that, uh, also the, the, I think there's always been pro, um, pro-sociality in all human groups for the clan or the tribe. That goes back, I mean, that's part of our nature. So this is a more anonymized version of it. You know, that's right. Sort of being pro-social in the abstract, which yes. is a thing that that's I almost could imagine like people wouldn't be able to comprehend that, I think that's clan the, environment. Exactly. I think that has been the big change. The idea that your clan is humanity, uh, 
mm -hmm. is a, a new and I would say a kind of a fragile and exotic concept. <laughs> fragile. One, one, yeah. that, one that ought to be nurtured, but one that does not come naturally to people. Our natural circle of empathy is much closer to the, the clan, the tribe, the, uh, the, the bloodline. Um, before we turn to questions, we have a 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, I just wanted to ask, you've spent a great deal of your time you know, researching the book that you just published face-to-face -face with the human capacity to do fairly awful things to each other. I mean, from the garroted bog men you know, to sort of the modern mechanized warfare and the horrors of sort of you know, dictatorial-style government. And um, how do you come out an optimist. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, there is a lot of grisly history uh, in, if you look at human affairs. Um, uh, as a, uh, you know, as a, a number guy, uh, I am encouraged by graphs. And if I just, and, but then to try and reinforce it with everyday life. Um, you know, when I live my life, I make very few decisions that are at all affected by the chance of coming to a violent end. You know, I'm sometimes careful. I don't, you know, I don't blunder down dark alleys in dangerous neighborhoods, but I'm almost certainly not going to die through violence. And it just doesn't, it's not part of my life. It's not part of the life of you know, most people I know. It's not part of the life of most people on the planet. Uh, if you just think of all, uh, and again, it's, you have to do this gestalt shift. Instead of thinking of all of the violence that occurs, if you just try to wrap your mind around all the violence that doesn't occur, that sounds a little perverse. But you just look in the park and you see you know, an interracial couple, and 50 years ago they could have been a target of violence. If you just look at the, how the, the, um, uh, what people make statues of, it used to be military heroes, and uh, now it's more likely to be uh, you know, sports figures and, and, and artists and, and, uh, and so on, who get streets named after them. When you start to reorient yourself for all of the ways in which we, violence is, is not the determining factor in our lives, the way it, history shows that it used to be, then, then you can be encouraged. And it, uh, it makes you see the world in a different way. It's hard for data to displace sort of anecdote in the human mind is the thing that we think it about. It is, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I think that's part of what education is for, to get people not to think of the anecdotes, but to think in terms of the, the numbers, which can reflect back on individual cases. When I watch you know, John Stewart or Colbert or, or Jay Leno, and they, they kind of insult the, the commander in chief, uh, I know they're not going to get drawn and quartered. You know, their head's not going to be put on a pike. But reading history, that's what have happened. It would have happened if they criticized the king you know, three or 400 years ago. Uh, you can make fun of the Pope, you can make fun of all kinds of people, and uh, the, the gift of a modern democracy is that you can do that. And we, we laugh at the joke, uh, but we, and we take it for granted that we can do that. That's just another example of appreciating things that we're apt to take for granted, but that were hard-won accomplishments. Right, and in those huge sliding graphs, like the real story is this extraordinarily large number of individuals that just get to live. Exactly. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. And that's harder to appreciate until you remind yourself of, uh, of, of the alternative. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. I, I'd like to open it up to the questions. I see a number of people lined up at the microphones. Um, this... I'm, something, something inside me said I was left-handed when I came out of the wound, so I'm going to start with the left, go left, right. <laughs> um, the first person on the left microphone, to my left, to your right. Uh, yeah. Um, apologies for my lack of memory and articulation, but um, I think a year or two ago maybe, um, I had seen some sort of anthropological study that was talking about the domestic, um, the domestication of, um, I believe it was foxes specifically, so in Russia, yeah. and it had shown over only the course of like maybe 20 to 30, maybe 40 generations, um, that foxes, uh, feral foxes, over that many breedings and selective breedings, they were killing off the ones that didn't show nicer traits to humans, um, started to take on the traits of infant foxes, mm -hmm. um, and then looked at this data and found it was the same with uh, dogs, et cetera, and then also started to look at human data, and found, or at least human examples, and had found that there was also a rough um, continuation of that, or I guess transplanting of that same idea. Um, through evidence. So I'm just wondering um, if you can maybe speak to, this is going back to you talking about how, you know, 
we've only been around for, I think, 50 generations-ish. And it seemed to be suggesting that you were shying away from saying that um, we have evolved to be less violent. So I'm just wondering if you can maybe speak a little bit more on that subject, or if you're aware of that study, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. Yes, that's right. So the, in, in that, uh, that fascinating study, if, if uh, they simply selectively bred foxes for uh, willingness to approach a human, that is the, uh, the lack of fear and uh, uh, which can switch into hostility, just willingness to, to be with a strange uh, uh, individual. And, uh, and as you noted, together with that particular trait, there was a number of traits that seemed to preserve um, juvenile traits into adulthood, both physical juvenile traits and um, behavioral juvenile traits, such as playfulness. Uh, so this process, sometimes called neoteny, the preservation of juvenile traits in adulthood, uh, seems to have occurred in part over the long term in human evolution. There are some ways in which a adult human is like a baby chimp. There are other ways in which we're not. Our vocal tract is nothing like a, a baby chimp. Uh, and, it's, uh, and in fact, our own babies have more chimp-like vocal tracts than, uh, than, than we adults do. Uh, and a lot, of mo a lot of evolution is mosaic. Some traits follow certain trajectories, others follow other trajectories. So there is, uh, we don't, from the fact that some neoteny has occurred in the evolution of modern Homo sapiens, we don't know that the selective regime was parallel to that which was uh, that the fox breeders used with the silver foxes. That is, we don't know if, that, if it was selective breeding for some kind of tameness or domestication in our ancestors that was the force that gave us these juvenile traits, although it, it, is, uh, it is plausible. Uh, but we also don't know, and we also don't know whether over the time spans in which I've tried to document declines of violence, if there was another bout of uh, selection for neoteny. That is, in, uh, the, the neoteny that we know occurred uh, was over the span of hundreds of thousands of years. Whether there was a, another burst of it over the last few thousand years, say since the uh, advent of civilization and government, or even more recently in the consolidation of states, uh, we don't know. And I'm probably no one's going to study that anytime soon. But it, it's not impossible. OK, another microphone. Dr. Pinker, your research obviously goes back <clears throat> several millennia. But in the 21st century, could you comment on the relationship of violence to free universal access to firearms or to knowledge on how to build an IED or a bomb? And maybe throw in something about fundamentalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, um, you know, there's the, the relationship of rates of violence to availability of weapons is, is complex. It's not as if the more weapons, the more violence. Because, you know, we've been, well, the, the statistics in the United States are uh, themselves complex because there are obviously way more guns than there used to be. But there are actually fewer households with guns. So there are more kind of gun nuts arming themselves to the teeth, but fewer actual households that bother to get their first gun. Uh, also, it's also true that in the last 20 years, where certainly the number of, of guns hasn't decreased, the rate of violent crime has plummeted. Uh, the, um, so uh, despite the fact that I, I certainly believe that common sense measures of gun control really ought to be passed, and it's ludicrous that we, our government can't pass any of them, even the most obvious ones, I don't think it's the major driver of rates of violence uh, in, in this country. Um, in terms of improvised explosive devices, they, uh, you know, they're, they're probably, if, if you count up the number of people who've been killed by them, each one of them is a, a tragedy. But it's not as if they've led to an increase in the number of casualties of war compared to earlier periods. Uh, so it, that has not led, compared to, say, Vietnam, compared to Korea, to say nothing of the world wars, when the main weapons of destruction were not uh, IEDs, but more people were killed. Uh, our, you know, artillery, um, tanks, uh, aerial bombardment, uh, uh, machine guns can kill an awful lot of people, and IEDs are very public, and uh, you know, we care more about the life of each soldier than we used to. But they haven't actually sent the body counts upward. Uh, and then we said, say something about fundamentalism. 
Well, it's, uh, you know, I think it's a bad thing. Um, I think you know, uh, in identifying the different causes of violence, especially large-scale violence, high body counts, it is um, perhaps paradoxically idealistic utopian belief systems that contribute some of the biggest body counts. Uh, things like the European wars of religion, the Crusades, the effects of Nazism, communism, uh, nationalism, all of these can motivate people to commit uh, violence for no selfish gain to, for themselves. It's not as if, they, if you're a, uh, a revolutionary, you're trying to accumulate a lot of harem, of, a big harem of nubile women or you know, huge piles of gold. You're bringing a utopia to earth. Uh, and that is what can lead to massive body counts because if you, your belief system is such that you're going to create a world that will be infinitely good forever, then any kind of cost-benefit analysis will say, you can, you can kill as many people as you want, and you're always ahead of the game. You're always doing more good than harm. And moreover, anyone who stands in your way is the only thing that is preventing you from creating a world that will be infinitely good forever. Well, how, how evil are they? Uh, you do the math. And so you have justification for wiping out large numbers of people because they are uh, uh, confounding your vision for a utopia. So belief systems uh, that are not humanistic, that don't put a value on an individual life, but rather the glory of the nation, the class, the race, the religion, the uh, way of life dictated by a religion are, are very, very, can be very, very dangerous. Yeah. We've run right up against our hour. Um, I don't know if what happens is the orchestra starts to play and it gets very embarrassing for all of us, or if we can... Or a big uh, shepherd's crook uh, comes out from the wings. Yeah. Um, I have nothing to do for the next few minutes, and I'm happy to sort of entertain a couple more questions, but the rest of you may not agree. I, would you mind doing a couple more questions? Is that all right? I don't, I don't mind. Excellent. Um, let's do that. Jason, you, forgive me? Okay. What I'd like to do to make sure that we, just, we cover a decent amount of ground is to have the next three people up there just ask questions, machine guns. Sorry, that's the wrong metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like to do is have three people ask questions in sequence <laughs> without Steven answering them, and then, uh, Steve, you can just respond okay. um, sort of collectively. So just sure. let's have one, one, two, three. No problem. Um, so you said two things tonight that um, you don't think that we've uh, been bred Gen or we don't, you don't think that violence has been bred out of us genetically quite yet, and that you expressed a fear in, um, you know, climate change maybe um, bringing out a, a change in the trend of, of decreased violence. So my question is, uh, if chaotic climate periods narrows the sieve of natural selection, um, what if there are sleeper genes that are in us that may come out that help survival but maybe look bad in, in terms of our present context. Okay, thanks. Next question. Yes, and my question would be, um, considering you're saying that it's ultimately our environment that is uh, determining uh, our violent behavior, I wanted to hear your thoughts about are we, what type of personal responsibility is appropriate to put on those who commit violent acts? Are we right to say those who are violent should be held personally responsible if ultimately it's one's environment that is determining violence. Mm -hmm. And one more question. I wanted to ask if um, you considered the possibility that um, popul the increase in population density might be a, a cause of a decrease in violence in spite of the uh, behavioral sync experiment. Mm -hmm. two, okay. in, two exogenous factors and one in the personal, in the question of what role the individual plays. What role the individual plays, yes, okay. So the uh, sleeper genes that might be selected for in cases of climate stress, very hard to say because it's not clear what would be the contingencies of who would survive, who wouldn't in cases of, say, if there was massive famines and population movements. Uh, to what extent would the ones who live and the ones who die and the ones who breed be determined by psychological traits that uh, we can't even, since we don't know what that world would be like, we don't really know what traits would be favored. So I think I'll have to pass on that, that I, I think we just don't know. 
Uh, personal responsibility, I'm glad that you brought up the question of can we hold people responsible if their uh, violent acts can be traced to their environments because it is a lovely inversion of the common question of can we hold people responsible if we discover uh, that they have genes that lead to uh, increased likelihood of violence. And I completely agree that the, que the moral and political question is as pointed in either case. You know, one case, the, you could imagine the defense lawyer saying, um, look, at the, look, my, my, my client uh, is one of the PGP 100,000. We got his genome scanned back. Look, he's got a gene for uh, violence. So he didn't do it. His genes did. Uh, he deserves to walk. On the other hand, you can have, well, you know, my, he's depraved on account of he's deprived. His uh, parents split when he was young. He grew up in the ghetto. So my client deserves to walk for that reason. Uh, how do we uh, evaluate both reasons in terms of whether we should reform our notion of personal responsibility when it comes to criminal acts. Uh, I, I talk about this in, in uh, my book, The Blank Slate. I think ultimately it depends on, um, on uh, general deterability. That really for all the talk of cosmic justice and scales of, of, of uh, justice and so on, uh, criminal justice has ultimately a practical function and that is to um, deter antisocial acts. And uh, to the extent that there is enough elasticity in behavior that it responds to whether we hold people responsible, uh, including thinking ahead of the game and anticipating the way people and their defense lawyers might game the system, uh, if we set up a set of laws and, and, and rewards and punishment so that people will think twice about uh, murdering their, their girlfriends or shooting the guy, the clerk in the 7-Eleven, or setting off a bomb at the marathon, then we should keep those contingencies. I think that's a kind of justice that we, uh, ju judicial system that, that um, serves a purpose that we ought to keep. Uh, the only case in which we have to rethink it are in cases that are related to the insanity defense in the sense that if someone is really uh, uncontrollable enough or irrational enough that having a law that says we'll throw you in jail if you har harm someone else won't do any good, then um, it doesn't make sense to apply that system to them. We still might want to lock them up to protect ourselves against dangerous elements in the same way that we can uh, commit someone to confinement in a psychiatric hospital even if they are uh, found not guilty by reason of insanity, but it would be under a different logic. In both cases, it is a practical set of tactics to minimize the amount of violence. Then the uh, third question, what was the third question? Population density. Oh, population density. It, you're right in noting that the, uh, what was a conventional wisdom starting in the 60s, namely if you crowd people together, they'll start to attack each other, that we know is completely wrong. I mean, it was based on studies with rats and people are not like rats. And the, some of the most densely populated uh, places on Earth are some of the most peaceful uh, places on Earth, like Hong Kong, like Tokyo, uh, like, uh, like Western Europe. So the idea that you crowd people and they'll start killing each other is totally wrong. Would it have the opposite effect? Could it actually make people um, more peaceable? I don't know if it would by itself, although in general cities, um, are often sources of progressive liberal ideas because you have people coming together and exchanging ideas with that kind of density that a city provides. Cities like Boston, Amsterdam, London, uh, Paris historically have had that role. Uh, also, cities can be easier to police. Now, you can have higher rates of violence in ungoverned areas of cities, but uh, some of the declines in violence since the 1990s, such as in New York, show that the density of a city allows you to gather data and um, apply tactics that in a concentrated areas that, uh, that can allow you to tame violence that's harder to tame in uh, unruly, anarchic, uh, tribal, mountainous areas like uh, Afghanistan. So I think there is something to your question. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope the data does give us this sort of bulwark of optimism in a tough time. Um, and thanks for your work. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you.